Today it's the book of John, chapter 19, verses 28 and 29. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And a special thanks to the new praise singers who are in their second service already, and we're going to allow some of them to slip out. Usually, uh, my husband and I attend the Common Foundation, Modern Worship in the Fellowship Hall, so I may not know many of you that are here. So let me introduce myself. Hi, my name is Beverly. And I'm thirsty. <sighs> that was good. My husband, Kim, and I moved here after I retired in June of 2018 to be close to our two sons and our two grandsons. But today's message is not about me. It's about the last words of Jesus. Many of you will already know that all four Gospels tell of Jesus being offered wine while dying on the cross. And you know that anything that's mentioned in all four Gospels must have some important lesson for us to pay attention to. But today I want to point out that only John's account included his desperate cry. I am thirsty. As uh, Jono pointed out with the children, many contemporary scholars have used this as an argument to convince people that Jesus was really fully human. But I have to tell you that the first century witnesses to the crucifixion, the ones who walked with Jesus and knew him, they understood that he was fully human. They had seen him eat and drink. They had observed him grow weary and sleep. And on that last day, they had heard him cry out and bleed. But for today, I want to tell you that these words, I am thirsty, were included to affirm for us that Jesus understands our suffering. I confess, I have never really experienced the pangs of hunger as a result of malnutrition. But I know thirst. Perhaps you do too. One of the things I learned after moving to Georgia was that there are conditions here that promote thirst. I call it the uh, double 90s, you know, when the temperature is above 90 degrees and the humidity is above 90 degrees, it's hard. It really is tough. I discovered, since I moved to Georgia, a particularly thirst-induced activity, hauling wood chips. I am up for a good challenge, I want to tell you. And I found that chipdrop.com will deliver a whole truckload of wood chips to you wherever you want it. The only problem is they can't tell you when it'll come and you have to take the whole truckload. A truckload of wood chips is a lot of wood chips. Here's a picture of one of my recent wood chip deliveries. The, the, the white picket fence behind the, the, is four feet tall. So this is a lot of wood chips. Um, if you've been by Tillman House in the last month, you may have seen a similar pile there because I arranged to have wood chips delivered to go around our garden. It makes really good mulch, but it's hard to move it. My estimate is it takes me about 15 hours 
to shovel those wood chips into a plastic, plastic bin in my garden cart, to pull the cart around to wherever in the yard I want to dump it, to pick up that bin and dump it over, and then go back and do it again and again and again. 15 hours. Now, I don't do all 15 hours at once. I have my limits. Usually, three hours is about my daily limit because I get thirsty and I get worn out. You see, these wood chips are mixed with dust, sawdust. They're mixed with thin little branches that get in the way when you try to shovel and you <laughs> just can't quite get under it. And every now and then, a big log. And breathing the dust from that big pile of wood chips, usually in the hot sun. Sometimes I'm smart and I order it on a, in a season where it's not quite so hot, but in July when the wood chips come, it's hot. Remember, the double 90s. So I always have available a refillable water bottle. Mm, this is good. Filled with Cobb County water. No fancy water bottles for me. I hate those single-use plastic bottles. Don't get me started. So I bring my own water. And I've discovered a few things hauling wood chips. Uh, there are some physical symptoms of dehydration. Do you know them? It's not just a dry mouth. Not just a dry mouth. There's the dizziness and the muscle fatigue and the confusion and the reduced cognitive processing. That means the brain melts and it drips out your ears. No doubt, Jesus experienced all of these. You see, on those last days of his life, first of all, he had lost blood from the flogging. He'd lost blood from that crown of thorns pressed down into his scalp. And he'd lost blood from the nails that were pounded into his hands. Oh, you can't see my feet, but I'm point. In addition, I have to assume that he was sweating. It was a hot day, and he had the exertion of hauling that cross at least partway to the hill. Apparently, he needed some help. It was pretty tough work. And finally, I'm guessing Jesus shed a few tears on that day. Not just from the physical exertion of the work and the physical pain, but also that emotional pain that he experienced. Blood, sweat, and tears. Of course, Jesus was thirsty. And we are told the guards offered him some wine. Now, they could have offered him water, but scholars tell us those soldiers were drinking wine. And it was not what we used to call it when I was a kid or when I was a teenager, the good stuff. This was the cheap stuff, the, the sour wine, the spoiled wine, the wine that you diluted with a little water just to get it down. What you might not know is that at least two of the Gospels tell that this was not the first time Jesus was offered wine that day. Matthew and Mark's Gospel record that before he was nailed to the cross, as they were preparing to put those nails into his hands, the soldiers offered him some wine the cheap stuff, mixed with some bitter herbs, gall or myrrh, something that was used in those days to dull the pain. 
probably it made it easier for the guards to put those nails in, knowing they'd at least tried to relieve the pain of this person being crucified. But they both record that Jesus refused the wine that first time, mixed with the bitter herbs to ease the pain, as if once he had accepted drinking that cup that his father had offered to him, he wanted to experience the full experience of the pain of death. He understood that it would be painful, and still he refused, until at the very end, when Jesus was near death, he agreed to at least sate a bit of that physical thirst. He took some of the sour wine from a sponge raised up from a hyssop branch. Hyssop, is that significant? Maybe. I don't know. Some people argue, oh, a hyssop branch isn't strong enough to do. That's not the point. (laughs) You know what? The point is, Jesus understands suffering. He really died. I would have to argue that those first century observers at the crucifixion were more likely to have questioned Jesus' divinity than his humanity. Maybe they hadn't seen the miracles he had performed, the healings, turning water into wine, but they could see him suffer. They knew he was human. There's no argument from this text that Jesus suffered physical thirst. Dizziness, muscle fatigue, confusion, and even reduced thinking. But I can also imagine Jesus experienced a spiritual thirst that day. Think about it. The day before, he had been betrayed by Judas. One of his closest disciples, Peter, had denied even knowing him. And as he hung on that cross, all but the beloved disciple, whom we assume was John, were hiding. They were not there. His friends had abandoned him. And two weeks ago, here, we heard that as Jesus was on that cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Surely, after submitting to God's will that he die on the cross, Jesus experienced the desolation of being separated from the Father who loved him. He was alone. So as we remember how Jesus was literally dying from dehydration, I have a question for you. Yeah, I ask a lot of questions. What is it that you thirst for today? Just as most of us have experienced the pain of physical thirst at least a little bit, surely we have also known those pains of spiritual thirst. The advertisers, they know what it is we're longing for. They know how to trigger those desires in us to connect us with their products and their services. So you're feeling lonely? What'll you have? A soft drink? 
a burger, some wine, or something stronger? Are you feeling unappreciated or unimportant? Well, you just need some new jewelry or some new clothes. Is your life just unhappy? All you need is this vacation or this new diet plan. And maybe, maybe you just lack purpose in your life. Well, you just need a new toy or a new pastime to distract you. It's a trick. They know what you want and they pair up the images and sensations of your happiness with something they're selling. Friends, we are all thirsting, not just for water. We're thirsting for that living water that Jesus offered to the Samaritan woman at the well. Do you remember she had come to take water back to her household, but she came in the middle of the day, the heat of the day, because she didn't want to be seen by the other women. And Jesus offered her something that would last, living water from a well that would never run dry. I'm reminded of the words from Psalm 63, where it says, Oh God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I've seen this kind of thirst in my ministry in local churches. I've seen it more recently in my spiritual direction practice. Someone is diagnosed with a serious illness or a loved one has died. They have an important decision to make and they don't know which way to turn. They just can't seem to find God anywhere. Maybe their faith is intermixed with a little bit of doubt. They can't find joy in the mundane things of life. Where is that Holy Spirit power and guidance that we were all promised? Why do I feel abandoned when I know God is still here? This morning, as we remember how Jesus suffered a desperate thirst on that cross, I'm also reminded that we are facing a global water crisis. Did you know 663 million people around the globe lack access to clean, safe drinking water? 663 million. But even more staggering, over a billion people have no knowledge of Jesus. And they have little chance of hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ before they die. Yeah, some live in remote parts of the globe that we would never go to, but I have to tell you, others live on your street or right around the corner. What are you doing about this spiritual crisis? Matthew 25 tells us that when Jesus returns and the nations will be judged, they are judged by how they respond to anyone who was hungry or thirsty, as if they responded to Jesus himself. Jesus was thirsty on that cross, but friends, he is still thirsty today. Jesus is thirsty when anyone is thirsty, physically or spiritually. And you and I, we are challenged to take on the hard work of giving 
a cup of cold water to anyone who needs it. We can relieve Jesus' thirst today as we work together to meet those physical and spiritual needs of others. Lord, we pray, please make it so. Amen.